the title of your new book is At First There Was the Feeling. So how is, do feelings influence the biological development of human culture? Can you explain this to, uh, to me? Yes. So um, it's a very interesting story. Feelings are sort of the, 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 the nearby beginning of cultures in the sense that it is feelings that motivate uh, us to build, to invent, and to create all the artifacts and instruments of culture. And it doesn't make any difference where you look, whether you look at art, visual art, or music, uh, or moral systems, or governance, uh, justice, um, or whether you look at science and technology. Although all of those spectacular developments of humanity are in fact due to our invention, to our creativity, to the fact that we have knowledge and reasoning, none of that would happen if we would not have been motivated to do those things. And people very often forget that there is that motivation, that there is the need to do certain things. One of the things that I want to do with this book is call attention to feelings as the motivators, the monitors, and the negotiators of all our processes of culture, whether they occur in the arts, in literature, or whether they occur in the social and political space. That's the interesting point. And how does it correspond then with the brain? Because feelings also are produced in our brain, aren't they? Yeah, feelings are in fact produced in our brain, but not only by the brain. They're produced in our brain in interaction with the body. That's another thing that uh, in this book, probably more than before, uh, I have done it before in articles and other books, but now I'm doing it much more clearly. I'm saying, look, feelings are not the exact uh, production only of the brain. They're, the pr they're produced by a cooperation between the brain and the body. The brain is, in the end, a servant of the body, not the body a servant of the brain. We very often have the, the relationship wrong. You also mention very often your reflection is uh, in the homeostasis. So yes. could you please explain this state of balance? Yes. So w w what happens with homeostasis is this, is that it is the sort of um, uh, governance of life. Uh, you can, a good synonym of homeostasis is regulation of life. So in order to keep alive, whether it's one cell or ten or a whole organism which is made of millions and millions of cells, you need to keep each cell and the whole organism within very tight parameters. They need to be, if you go a little bit this way or a little bit that way, you're going to die. You're going to get sick and you're going to die. You know, keeping alive and having homeostasis is a little bit like the work of a jongleur that is trying to keep the balls up in the air and all it needs is a little mistake and one of the balls falls. Feelings are an expression of this. So feel, you have to see feelings as the expression, the representation, it's like a painting. In fact, it's very much like a painting and a musical score. The feelings are representing what goes on in your body. And if something is going wrong, you're going to have a bad feeling. You're going to have discomfort, malaise. Uh, you're going to feel like you're getting sick. Uh, so that is the representation. So you have to imagine it as if you are literally painting uh, and drawing and having a musical score that represents the organs that are not working right, the chemistry that is not right. That's what, what is a feeling. And so the, the relation is between feelings and homeostasis, and homeostasis is the regulation of life. It's what's at the bottom. So a human being is much more than an algorithm and can't be Absolutely. copied from a computer or something like this. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's not, uh, in the end, it's not so funny because there are people that are totally convinced that minds are nothing but computer programs and that minds or even whole organisms are captured by algorithms. 
there are some people that actually say we are nothing but algorithms. Now, of course, if you think that, you're not going to be very worried about killing the algorithm because, in fact, the algorithm is not alive. And, and this has uh, very important consequences for what we think is proper moral behavior in relation to creatures. If you think that we are just made of algorithms and we can be substituted, then there is no end to what you can do to a human being. Which so it's a sort of dream of uh, being immortal, but uh, isn't this also a sort of nightmare if it comes out? Uh? I think it's a complete nightmare, uh, but uh, there are many people that don't think that. There are many people that think that, in fact, they can download their minds uh, into a computer system and become immortal. Now, of course, I have no idea what it would be like to download a mind, and the people that say that obviously have no idea what a mind is, given the fact that a mind is the result of the interaction of a, a, a brain and the body. That is absolutely impossible. They don't know it, but it is impossible. So. Uh, the, only, the only reason why I'm not worried about it is that th that's a sort of dream that will not go anywhere. It's just, uh, it's just inconvenient because the people that are thinking about it do not know enough to realize that what they're saying doesn't make any sense. But uh, it, it is a bit troubling. And I think if, if you would have to live forever, then you would also have to revise your culture completely because our culture is actually built because of feelings on the fear of mortality. It's the fear, the, f the feeling of fear of your own death, of your own mortality, and of the mortality of those that you love and that love you. That is one of the controls of our culture. You rapidly emphasize the meaning of small organisms, uh, special bacteria. Yeah. Um, I read this in the book and yeah. I listened to lectures, so this is remarkable. What is so special about this and uh, why have these <laughs> small organisms so a special role? Yeah, well, they, 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 they have this special role because at the beginning, uh, even before there were many cells and there were nervous systems, they already, with that kind of life and the mandate to stay alive and to continue, they were using strategies of behavior that included cooperation, that included competition and fight, uh, and that included emotivity. So, for example, you can poke a bacterium uh, with a small sort of pin and the bacterium will go like this. Precisely the same thing that if I were now threaten you, you would wince and retract. That is basic emotivity. You know, the, the, the most basic forms of emotion that we have are emotions of joy or startle. You know, you get frightened by something. Bacteria already show the beginnings of that kind of behavior. So when we, when we think about our emotions and our feelings, we may have the false idea that this is coming with us and that we are the sort of champions of this thing and we are pushing forward with these novelties. That's not true. The novelties have been there for billions of years and they are there because of life. And then one day there will come nervous systems and guess what? They appropriate those strategies and they do more things with it And that's how you develop feel, feelings and consciousness and so forth, and eventually our intellect. But the, the, the story needs to be told um, by going back into the origins of life and trying to make sense of the evolution of these things. And that's why the original title of the book is The Strange Order of Things, just to make people realize that, you know, it's a little bit, I, I expected it to have, I expected to have just those very complex behaviors come with big brains and smart people, and guess what? They come with very humble beginnings. You know, your science is a relatively young science, so mm -hmm. what do you think, on which point are we, and uh, do you have a special puzzle or problem you want to solve in the next time? 
um, after feelings. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the, the, yes, and, and, uh, and it's true that neuroscience is a, a, a young science, but uh, it, it's advancing very well. It's a science with a great pedigree, because uh, when people ask me, so who is the great cognitive scientist or the great psychologist, for that matter, um, that, that you admire in history? And many people are expecting me to say somebody in the past 50 or 100 years, and I say Shakespeare. Shakespeare did the best for us. Because if you look at Shakespeare, if you go through the plays, you have representations of all the big dramas of humanity, all the big comedies of humanity, and they are analyzed in terms of their motivations, and you, they follow through the end. Um, but there again, if you look at Hamlet, or at Othello, or at um, uh, Macbeth, uh, or for that matter at uh, one of the comedies or the, the history plays. The, the, the machinery of the motivation of those creatures is this constant negotiation between a, an emotion and a feeling and the intellect that goes there. Poor Hamlet ends up doing what he does because he has extremely complicated feelings in relation to the death of his father, the apparent usurpation of the place of his father by the uncle uh, and the mother that may not be behaving as well as he wanted her to. And then his reasoning is influenced by that. And, he, he, and, and there are all the hesitations that he goes through. It's not something that you can explain in intellectual terms alone. Nor can you I mean, go to Othello and you cannot explain it intellectually. You need to explain it because of this tremendous jealousy that Iago plays, you know, like, like a, a puppet master. Um, so, I, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you Shakespeare as my, as my hero uh, n neuroscientist, psychologist. But um, the problem that I really intend to spend the rest of my life with has to do with both consciousness and feeling because the great paradox is that you cannot understand feelings without consciousness and you cannot understand consciousness without feelings. One came with the other. When you say, I feel pain or I feel desire, you have to be conscious to say that because if you were not conscious, you couldn't say that. How would you know? The, the, the ability to know that comes through consciousness is what allows you to know that you have those feelings. But historically, in evolution, feelings, when they developed, were already developing a very important component of consciousness, which is subjectivity. So it, it's, a, it's a big conundrum, and that's what interests me the most right now. And so not all is solved, and you have to... Oh, not all is solved at all. No, no, no. There's, there's Hopefully, in, in two or three years, we can have another conversation with the next chapter. <laughs>